Please open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I love that song, The Bible Stands. It's one I could sing every week. Obviously we don't, but it's so true. It's, it's so wonderful of a truth. And we're looking at the scriptures today in the scripture we're looking at speaks of the, the word of God, these very familiar verses and what the word of God is, the nature of it and, and what its function is, what it does. And it's a, it's a glorious passage and it's a glorious truth. And today we're actually just finishing up the sermon from last week. Uh, this passage of Hebrews 4, 1 through 13 is really a, a whole unit. And we went through the first four points last week, the first um, 10 verses. And our intention today is to study verses 11 through 13. But let's just have a quick review. The, we saw that the promise of God's rest, because that's what this passage is all about. It goes all the way back to chapter 3, where it started. But the promise of God's rest still stands and it's realized by faith, we saw in those first three verses. And also the promise of God's rest is actually rest that God himself possesses and enjoys. It's not, it is rest that God gives to us as believers, but it's, it's his rest. Um, it's not something that he has that, that he's he's just giving to us, but it's actually something that he possesses himself and enjoys. We also saw last week the promise of God's rest has continued throughout the history of man. It started back, he said he um, rested on the seventh day. That's when God's rest began, and, and it's uh, been throughout um, history, and it's been offered to those who will believe God throughout history. And the last thing we saw last week was entering God's rest involves resting from one's works. We looked at that in verse 10. And what we'll be looking at today is this idea, this concept taught here is that we must diligently strive to enter God's rest. Now that, that sounds a little bit strange at first because we know we sang this morning, salvation is by grace alone. You know, so why, why, or what does it mean to, to strive to enter God's rest? Um, and, and we'll see how this plays out in this passage because we need to understand the words here and, and in the context of, of what he's saying here. This passage on entering God's rest began with a warning. It, it began with this warning and then it focused on the promise of entering God's rest and the character of that final rest. And now he's going to close out this, this section, and he once again returns to this warning using similar words with how he began the section. He says here, he, he first of all, he, he exhorts us. We're, we're exhorted to diligently strive to enter God's rest. Um, note, note what he says. Let's read verses 11 through 13. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So he gives this exhortation and the exhortation applies to, to everyone in the congregation of the believers. He says, let us. He, he includes himself. As he did in the very first verse of this chapter, he associates himself with his readers by using this first person plural. And he's expressing his oneness with them in Christ. And, and in effect, he's issuing this warning to not only to them, but he includes himself as well. So this verb translated strive means to 
Be diligent. In fact, some of the translations, that's how it's translated. Be diligent. Be diligent to enter that rest. Um, it means to be in earnest. It means to, to make every effort. Again, the translation um, in some, um, some of the uh, versions of the Bible. It means to concentrate one's energies on the achievement of a goal. And thus the, the exhortation encourages the recipients of this letter to, to display a spirit of zeal. And that's the exact opposite of what's going on here and what, what he's been drawing attention to regarding the Exodus generation, right? Remember, we gotta, we got to keep it in context here. They were not zealous. Rather, they were unconcerned with God's word. God's word that exhorted them and told them what to do. They were unconcerned with it, and it proved disastrous for them. Right? They, they, they all perished in the wilderness. And he's warning them that they too are in danger. Because entering God's rest is not something to be trifled with. It calls for the utmost serious attention. And Christians here, these, these early Christians that he's writing to, in all Christians since, up to, to this present day, we are warned to make sure that our faith is genuine. To make sure that our faith is authenticated by our active obedience to the word of God. The warning not only applies to everyone in the congregation of believers, or the exhortation, but it's also, as an exhortation, it's also a warning. And this warning applies to everyone in the congregation. He says, so that no one, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. He said this same thing back in chapter 3 and verse 12, if you recall. You can look back there if you like. He, he, he says that no one may fall away from the living God, he said in chapter 3 and verse 12. And the, the, the consequence of failing to, to heed the warning is that they could fall away from the living God and thereby be under God's judgment. And as we've seen repeatedly in this section, which begins with that verse, chapter 12, or verse 12 and chapter 3, what he's doing is, is he's, he's quoting Psalm 95 and he's giving us an exposition of Psalm 95. We've talked about this as we went through... Um, chapter 3. And it began with a command for the whole community to take, to take care, to, to, to be on guard, lest any individual within that community might fall away. They might become an apostate. So the whole congregation is urged to be watchful for their fellow believers, not only for themselves, but, but he's speaking to the whole congregation and he says, take, take care, be careful, be concerned about this. Pay attention to this. That, that no one, yourself included, but others as well, that they don't fall away. And you see it again. Remember back in, in verse 1 of chapter 4 here, where he says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. The warning again once again, appeals to that Exodus generation whose unbelief was exposed by their dis disobedience. They had left Egypt. They had followed Moses out of Egypt, but they had not all believed. And the readers of this epistle are exhorted and warned to see the potential parallel between their ancestors and themselves. They had also started well. They had heard the gospel. All of them had heard the gospel. And they had responded to it in such a way that they were recognized as Christians. They're recognized as believers. At least outwardly on the basis of their profession of faith. They, they said they believed. They said they repented of their sin. They said they left their sin and, and were following Christ. And from what we can gather, you know, and we don't have a lot of information on this, right? Just what's in the, in the, in the letter itself, pretty much. We talked about this at the, in the introduction to, to Hebrews. But 
From what we can gather, it appears that some of these readers were considering abandoning Christianity and going back into Judaism. And, and this would be disobedience to God. This would be disobedience to the one who had promised them rest. It would be a departure from the living God. Let me read what, what one commentator said here. He said, Those of the desert wanderings failed to enter God's promised rest because they stopped short of obedience to God's command to enter. By disobeying, by distrusting God, and by taking their own counsel as to what would be best in the situation, they failed to enter God's rest. Correspondingly, the hearers of Hebrews must not stop short of obedience to God's call to enter the promised Sabbath rest of atonement. Stop short, that is, failing to combine hearing the gospel with faith, that is, trusting obedience, results in spiritual devastation. Therefore, the listeners should be obedient to the voice of God, which they have heard. So, so what, what is he saying here? What's the writer of Hebrews saying here? Well, we need to understand, he, he's saying the same thing James says in James chapter 2. When James says, faith without works is dead. You profess to know God, you profess to be one of God's children, you profess to be a follower of Christ. Well, well does your life back it up? Is essentially what James is saying, and that's what the warning is here. Of course, James cites Abraham as the one uh, one as an example who had genuine faith he believed God when God spoke to him remember it says he believed and God in in his because he believed God counted that to him as righteousness because he believed God he he believed God and when God spoke his word to him Abraham demonstrated his faith clearly when he obeyed God even by his willingness to sacrifice his son. He, he didn't abandon God when God commanded him to do something extremely difficult that was against Abraham's heartfelt desires. Did Abraham want to sacrifice his son? I mean, was that Abraham's will? Of course not. What person in their right mind wants to sacrifice their son? Nobody. And yet... He showed his faith by his works. He showed his faith by his obedience. A genuine faith is a faith that results in obedience. And the warning here in Hebrews is to make sure that your faith and my faith is that kind of faith. So, so entering God's rest, it, it's not accomplished by ceasing to put forth an effort to obey God. Um, we've talked about this in the past, this idea, let go, let God. You're not going to find that in Scripture. It's, 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 not, it's not you trust Christ and, and you're a Christian and now you just, you know, okay, let it happen. Whatever happens, happen. No, no, not at all. You, you don't cease to put forth an effort to obey God, but, but rather entering God's rest is accomplished by an active response of faith in God's word that results in obedience to his word. The instrument with, with which a disobedient human branch is, is pruned away from God, who is the true vine, is as the next verse, the, this, this sharp sword of the word of God. God uses his word. That's God's instrument that he chooses to use in the lives of people to discern their spiritual condition, to show them where they are, and to accomplish his purposes. So in verse 12, we, we really see the, the nature and the function of the word of God. And this serves as a motivation to strive to enter God's, God's rest. Do we... We, talk, we just sang about it. The Bible stands every test we give it for. His author is divine. 
We talk about reading the scriptures and how important it is for each of us as believers to, to be in our Bibles and reading them and studying them and coming and hearing preaching and, and teaching and, and being involved in Bible study with other believers. We, we talk about the importance of that all, all the time and, and it's so important. But we need to really understand what exactly is the nature and the function of, of God's word. Because when we do that, it, it helps. It serves as a motivation um, for us to do this striving, to this being diligent to enter God's rest. In verse 11, the disobedience mentioned there at the end of verse 11, the same sort of disobedience, what, what, what was that disobedience? Well, it was disobedience to the word of God, right? God told the Israelites, go and enter the land. And they, they were fearful. The spies, not uh, 10 of the 12 spies came back and said, oh, wow, we can't do this. And they believed the spies rather than believing God. They didn't believe God, and therefore they, they didn't obey God. And, and the word of God can never be disobeyed with impunity precisely because it's the word of God. It's the word of God who, whose speaking cannot be idle. God's word is, is never without effect. So the word of God is, is really, it's, it's the communication of the will and the purpose of God to man. That's exactly what it is. And the writer of Hebrews here places this emphasis on the word of God in these final two verses, reinforcing the urgency of this matter to heed, to take um, to this, heed and, and, and give, give this urgency to be able to enter God's rest. And it really brings a, a climax to this idea of God speaking, which is, it's been a major part. I don't know if you've picked up on it. Of course, we've covered it as we've gone through it. But this major um, theme in these opening chapters, let's, let's just look back real quick. Look back at chapter 1. Do you remember how, how this starts out, this whole letter? The first two verses? Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke. That's the first thing he's going to talk about, God's word. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That's where he starts off, with, with the fact that God's word is, is to us. And then in chapter 2, in, in the first three verses there, you, you look through there, you see, he says, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. He says it's, it's the, the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. It, the word, the message, was declared at first by the Lord. He says and it was attested to us by those who heard. And he's, he's going through this and it just he's bringing out the fact God has spoken. God's word is, is there for us. It's there for us to hear. You come to chapter 3 and in verse 5 and he says that Moses was faithful to do what? To testify to the things that were to be spoken later. And then the whole section expositing Psalm 95 is, is an exposition of God's word. He says in verse 7 of chapter 3, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, and that goes down all the way down through chapter 4, verse 7, where we read again, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. So, so the whole section here, the whole first four chapters, has been speaking of God's word and God speaking and, and people hearing. And so this four, when we come to verse 12, chapter four, it begins with the word for, for the word of God is living and active. It, it ties verse 12 back to verse 11 and, and really to, to this whole concept, this whole theme of God's word 
It ties it back to these previous warnings and and it gives strong motivation for believers to give proper attention to their spiritual condition. Because understanding the nature and function of the word of God does serve as a strong motivation to strive to enter God's rest. You know, you read this and you you read it and you say, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than the two-edged sword. And and you keep reading here. In some some interpreters, um, and you may be tempted as well, to, to read John 1 into this passage. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Etc., etc., and then down in further on, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And, and you may, you know, be tempted to say, Well, this, this is a reference to the incarnate word, it's talking about Jesus, but it's not. Not in verse 12, the context of Hebrews clearly shows that's not what the writer has in mind. He's not referring to, to, to the incarnate word, the Son of God. No, he's referring specifically to the revelation of God in the scriptures. That's what he's been referring to in these whole first four chapters, right? And that's what he's referring to here. These references that we looked at clearly show that. So what is the nature of God's word? He says, for the word of God is living and active. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means it's filled with the vitality of God himself. It's living. And it's powerfully effective in its operation. In Acts 7.38, Stephen referred to God's word as living oracles. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.23 that the word of God is living and abiding. The word translated active here is the word from which we get our word energy. It has has the idea of being powerful and effective. And both in the Old Testament and in in first century Judaism, which was, of course, the the religion uh, of the Jews there at this time this letter was written, they considered the word of God to be the effective means of God's creative and, and judging activity. I mean, you can go all the way back to Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do so? He spoke them into existence by his word. And and, and you read through the prophets, and and what did he do? He judged people. He judged his own people. He judged nations by his word. And and it's it's powerful and effective. I'm sure you, you know these verses in Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God says, just like the rain comes and waters the earth and causes things to grow, it does what it's supposed to do, it does what it's intended to do, so does my word. My word goes forth, and it it does what it's intended to do. It accomplishes what it's intended to accomplish. And it's because of the vitality and the the powerful effectiveness of the word of God that we should be eager, diligent, to avoid the disobedience that was manifested in the past generation of the Exodus generation. And we need to make every effort to enter God's rest. Because his word to those Israelites in the wilderness fell on deaf ears. But but now his word is sounding forth through his son, he says here in in Hebrews 1, right? And and the, the word of God confronts us with the same choice of entry into, entry into God's rest or unbelief that the Exodus generation faced when Moses led them out of Egypt. The word of God said, go into the promised land, take the land, I'm giving it to you. And they had, they had a choice. They could go in and believe God and enter into this, this type of rest of Canaan land, the promised land, or they could not go in. <laughs> 
It's the, same, it's the same choice that the people of David's time had. When David confronts them he, with this psalm in Psalm 95, today if you will hear his voice, he says. It's the same, it's the same choice his generation faced in Psalm 95. God's word cannot fail to be alive and powerfully effective. And there's only one reason for that. It's God's word. Your word may not be alive and may not be powerfully effective, but this is God's word. It it expresses God's will, and, and God's will is never frustrated. God's will is never defeated. We may, in our finite minds, have a, have a hard time reconciling what we see going on with this concept that God is accomplishing his will and no one is thwarting it, nobody is stopping it. It may not be totally clear in our, in our minds, but, but that's the truth. Rather than being just an outdated book of, an, of a bygone era, the word of God is an active, dynamic voice with which everyone must reckon. It's active in the sense that it's, it's effective in carrying out God's intentions. The same word that brought the world into existence at creation still controls the universe and is continuously bringing the universe in to, to God's desired intentions, as, as we saw back in chapter 1, right? If you remember that. The word of God has the ability, it's doing all this, but it also has the ability to affect change in the lives of individuals. That's what it's meant to do. It's meant to be a dynamic, interactive, and and transforming power in the lives of human beings. I mean, you can go through the scriptures and see illustration after illustration of this, right? Think of Nebuchadnezzar. This pagan king. Think think of God's word to him and what what God did to him to bring him to the place where he confessed there's only one God, the God of heaven. It it was the word of God that that penetrated and and, and went into this man's life and and, and brought judgment to him that, that brought him to this place. And really that's the function of God's word, right? He says here in verse um, 12, middle of verse 12, that it, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word is said to be sharper than a two-edged sword that pierces and divides. Think about, again, think about the context here of, of all he's been saying up to this point. The effectiveness of God's word was demonstrated by his oath that prevented the Exodus generation from entering Canaan. You remember what happened, right? He said, go, and they said, no. And he said, okay, stay here and die. And they said, no, no, we'll go. No, we'll go. And so they, they defied God, and then after he said, no, don't go after they they lost their opportunity, but they defied God and they tried to enter the land anyway. And what happened? You read it, they they were driven back and fell by what? By the sword of the Amalekites and the Canaanites. Those addressed by Hebrews here, this, this letter to the Hebrews, they faced the word of God which is sharper than any two-edged sword because it exposes their thoughts and and renders them defenseless before God. When you disobey God, it's not just that bad things are going to happen to you, that God's going to bring the Amalekites against you or the Canaanites to destroy you. No, it's it's that, that God, God himself responds It's his word 
The author uses this imagery of a sword to to convey that that God's word is able to penetrate into the deepest recesses of a human being. So it's not simply a, a sharp sword, but it's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. And being sharp on both sides emphasizes that that it has this penetrating force, so sharp that it, it penetrates into the closest spaces and finds the most subtle divisions of the human being, the soul and spirit. Now, some people think they can distinguish between the soul and the spirit, and I'm not going to debate if, if man has, you know, is made up of soul, spirit, and body, or soul and spirit are in, in body. You know, I'm, we're not getting into all that. You can read whole books on that and still not know. But anyway, what, what, what he's saying here is the word of God is so penetrating that, that it, it can get right down to the very psychological and spiritual makeup of a person. That, that's what he's saying. He he says that it he, he says that, that it uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me um, even the the of joints and of marrow. Well, what is bone marrow? I could have Jackie or Ariel come up here and maybe a couple of you nurses <laughs> come up here and, and explain it a lot better than I can. And I'm not even going to try. I just went to uh, one of these medical websites, right? Lighten myself a little bit. I mean, I know it exists, but 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 really, bone bone marrow is just it, it's in the center of most bones, and it's in the what I read here in the in the spongy bones in your body near the ends of your bones, like where the joints are. And so so what's it saying? What's what's he saying here? He's saying, well, God's word is is that penetrating, that it can pierce the bone and separate the joints and the marrow. So, so the penetrating power of, of God's word is, is, is so great that it's able to probe even the innermost motives of a person that are undetectable by other people. God's word discerns, it, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The place where one's thoughts are formed and, and from where one's will originates. No wonder we're told not to harden our hearts and and, and no wonder we're told to recognize that an evil heart turns away from the living God. So the word of God doesn't just deal with externals, right? The, the word of God doesn't just judge the, the outward appearance of what other human beings see in us. No, it judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart in a thoroughgoing and comprehensive manner. In Acts 2.37, Peter had preached the gospel at Pentecost. And we read in that verse, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. Well, you go a couple chapters later in Acts chapter 5, and the apostles are confronted by the religious leaders. And the apostles respond with the word of God. They give them the word of God. In verse 33, we read their response. When they heard this, when they heard God's word through the apostles, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. And then, of course, you come to Acts chapter 7 and you've got Stephen's sermon and Stephen preaches the word of God to him. He gives this really wonderful history and in, in, in convicting message from the word of God to these Jewish religious leaders. And how do they respond in Acts 7.54? Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him and then they did what? Yeah, they stoned him. Yeah. So, so you see, you see this, this demonstrates the penetrating, dividing power of the word of God. It reveals what's in the heart of man and brings him to a place 
where he must choose to repent and believe, as those 3,000 did on the day of Pentecost, or they can choose to reject the word of God. So it can bring a person to repentance and faith like it did those in Acts 2. Or it can bring a person to reveal where it reveals their rebellion in the person's heart toward God. As we saw here in Acts 5 and in, 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 in chapter 7. So it, it says God told Samuel who he sent out to anoint the next king after Saul, right? And he goes through all the sons of Jesse. And God says, no, 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 no. And, 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 and then he chooses David. And, and he tells Samuel, what? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You know, here's, here's the bottom line. And you know this. You can fool other people. You can fool the preacher. You can fool your friends. You can fool your spouse and your children, at least for a while. You can put on a facade of religiosity and appear to everyone to be a genuine, God-fearing Christian. But you can't fool God. His word will expose you for who you are. That's what his word does. That's what one of the functions of his word is. And, and, and after saying all this about the word, what the, what the nature and the function of the word is, the author here makes a transition. He shifts from the word as the discerning instrument in verse 13 to the person of God himself. Because our diligent striving to enter God's rest is of utmost importance because of this omniscient judge, the judge of all the earth. Look at verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Nobody's life is hidden from God's eyes. Nobody. No creature is hidden from his sight. The penetrating power of God's word renders every creature totally exposed and defenseless in God's presence. Note the close connection here between God and his word. To be exposed by the word of God is to be examined fully by God himself. And therefore to be answerable to him. God's word searches a human being and, and according to what it exposes brings God to judgment on that person. This word naked, it's interesting it, 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 it does literally speak of, of nakedness, not having adequate clothing. But it was also used figuratively of, of being unprotected. That's one of the functions of clothes, right? To protect. And it was used that way. And the word translated expose, it, it can be translated as expose and, and pretty much be synonymous with naked. But, but this verb was also used in, in wrestling for bringing down an opponent by a decisive hold on the neck. So metaphorically, the point is not so much that the person is exposed, but that he or she is, is utterly helpless. They're in, they're in a stranglehold. So together, these two expressions vividly portray the desperate plight of a person when confronted by God's word. They are unprotected and helpless and, and God sees them in this wretched condition. In addition to, to that, the person is going to be required to give an account of himself to God. J just think about that. Here is, here is a, a sinner, a person who has sinned against God, is in, re in rebellion against God, and he's, he's totally exposed as being completely unprotected and absolutely helpless, and he's standing before the holy God. That's the picture here. And, and there's nowhere to go. There's no place of escape. There's no hiding. There's no more facade. It's gone. 
in those who have not responded to God's word with repentance and genuine faith are spiritually helpless and exposed as such before God. So the hearers of God's word must respond. Just like the Exodus generation. Just like David's generation. And here, this generation in the first century, these Hebrew Christians, are they going to truly believe the gospel? Are they going to follow Christ and enter his rest? Or are they going to remain in the spiritual desert in their disobedience, exposed before God and facing his judgment? Because he, he just comes right out and says it, right? He says every person will give an account of himself to God, to whom we must give account. Well, why all the warnings about making sure your faith is genuine? Why the exhortation to diligently strive to enter God's rest? Well, the, the author is bringing his, his argument to this final, inevitable conclusion. We must, we must, not might, it's not that it's a possibility, it's inevitable. We must give an account of ourselves to God. Of course, Paul says the same thing, right, in a t totally different context about not judging others. But, but what he says in Romans 14, 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. That's what this all comes down to, this whole matter of entering God's rest. Are you going to enter God's rest or are you not going to enter God's rest? Well, we'll understand this. The day is coming when you're going to stand before God. And you're going to give an account. Isn't it interesting that before closing out his revelation to mankind, in the very end, the last two chapters of the whole Bible, God describes the blessedness of living in eternal communion with him. But you, you know what he does just before that, right? Look with me over at Revelation 20. Because what the Lord gives us here, what the Lord gives us is he gives us a glimpse of what that final giving of an account is going to look like. This is just before he describes heaven and eternity with God. In Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, John says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Notice that verse there. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. The sharp, penetrating, discerning word of God that exposes the nakedness and helplessness of the sinful human being will be the judge of every person who rejects God's word. The revealed word of God tells us that those who refuse to repent and believe they fail to believe the word of God. They fail to believe the gospel of God's son. That they will be cast into an eternal place of judgment. Separated from the living God forever. Forever. A horrific place. Called the lake of fire. That's where unbelievers go. That, that's, where, that's where apostates go. Those who said they believed and then fell away and said they no longer believe. The apostates, that's where they're going to spend eternity. 
But there's another book that will be opened, right? We read that here in Revelation 20. Another book, in addition to the book that records the sinful rejection of God, those who rejected God and his word. And that's the Lamb's book of life. The book of life is mentioned several times in the book of Revelation. It's mentioned once or at least once in the Old Testament. It's mentioned other places in the New Testament. But at the end of Revelation 21, in verse 27, we read, nothing unclean will ever enter it. That's, that's God's place, God's abode. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The ones whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life are the ones who have genuinely believed the word of God. The ones who have genuinely believed the gospel of God about his son. They've repented of their sin and believed. Because as sinful human beings, we're all naked and exposed before God. We're all helpless before God. We have no hope on our own. And yet, of course, it's Jesus Christ who can deliver us from that. Jesus, the Son of God who came to this earth and, and he obeyed the Father. He obeyed God's will completely. He completely fulfilled all righteousness. Something that no human being, fallen human being, could ever do. He did it. He, and, and he perfectly Please, God, in everything he did, even to the thoughts and intentions of his heart. There was nothing there. There was no sin. He wasn't just putting on an outward appearance, appearing to be good and, and, and healing people and doing these marvelous things. No. What he did came out of his heart. What he said came out of his heart. He was perfectly sinless. And he's the only one and yet he died. He, he paid the penalty of, of sin in his own death, with his own blood. He died in God. He, he died as a substitute. And, and those who will receive him, those who will believe on him, God forgives their sin. He, he gives them his son's righteousness who has taken their sin on the cross. And those are the ones that are written in the Lamb's book of life. And those are the ones, God's people, that, that are genuine believers who demonstrate their faith by obedience to God. Those are the ones who will enter into his rest. And those who do not believe will not enter into his rest. Thus the writer of Hebrews says the promise of entering God's rest still stands. But he says, lest, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. And he says it again, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So th this is what this whole passage is about. God's rest is there for those who believe him, those who really trust him, who have faith in him, but is not there for those who don't believe. It's not there for those who who say they believe, and yet, like the Exodus generation, don't really have genuine faith because they don't obey. You know, whether or not you are a genuine believer in Christ is not something to be taken lightly. The admonition to strive to enter God's rest should, should really awaken all of us. This letter to the Hebrews has been in existence for almost 2,000 years. It's been read, it's been studied, it's been taught, it's been preached to countless people. And over the centuries, undoubtedly, many people have heard this passage of Scripture it, who have professed to know Christ and even believed that they were on their way to God's eternal rest, but they didn't have genuine faith. And, and they lived lives of disobedience to God. And today, 
It's being preached to us. It's being preached to us. And God knows your heart and he knows my heart. He knows why you do what you do. He, he knows your motivations. He, he knows your intentions. And he knows that none of them are perfect. If you're a true believer, if you're a genuine believer, of course that doesn't mean you're sinless. That doesn't mean you don't struggle against sin. The problem is, if you say you're a believer and you don't struggle against sin and you just willingly give in to sin and say, oh well. Now that, that's, that's a type of disobedience where, where that kind of person better say, whoa, wait a minute. Do I really know the Lord? Do I have genuine faith? I, I'm not concerned about my obedience to God. It doesn't bother me. That, that person's in trouble. If you're like that, yeah, you, you need to wake up. But if you struggle against sin, well, struggle. Strive. Diligently to enter that rest. Call upon the Lord. Ask for His grace. If, if your sins are forgiven in Christ, you're not going to pay the penalty of eternal death for your sins. It's just a question of, are they? You know, my responsibility as a pastor and as a preacher of the Word of God is not to try to, to frighten you or anybody into thinking that you're not saved. I would never want to, you know, unnecessarily cause anyone to think that they were on their way to hell. But my responsibility is to, to tell you that if you have genuine faith, if you are truly a believer in Christ, then you will have the desire to obey God. The direction of your life will be obedience to the will of God. Not a carefree, careless attitude. I'm going to do what I want to do, and it doesn't matter what God or anyone else thinks. I, I may put on a facade for other people, but I'm going to do what I want to do. That, that, that is what is so dangerous. That is what leads a person down the road to apostasy. We should be growing as Christians in our obedience. And again, this obedience, it's not just conformity to a list of rules and regulations, but an obedience to, to the word from one's heart. A life of obedience that comes out of a love for God and gratitude for His saving grace in our lives. The pathway to apostasy, which is falling away from the living God, is the path of disobedience to God's Word. And as I said last week, no, none of us want to go there, nor do we want to see anyone else go there. And that's why we're told to, to be on the watch for each other and not just ourselves. Every one of us here this morning is privileged in that God, by His grace, has seen fit to bring us into contact with the gospel. There are millions of people, billions of people, I would say, in this earth who have never heard the gospel. But you have. I have. We are privileged. And we need to make sure we don't take God's warnings lightly. He warned the Exodus generation. He warned David's generation. He warned this first generation of Christians. And he warns us today. You, I, we need to make sure that we are in a right relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, that is evidenced by our obedience. Not perfection, but our obedience and our desire to please God. Because Everyone, each one of us, will give an account of himself to God. Thank you, O Lord, for your grace. Thank you for the saving grace that you have blessed us with in your son, Jesus. Lord, perhaps everyone in this room this morning professes to know you.
Lord, only you know their hearts and only your word is capable of penetrating their hearts. We just pray for anyone here today who may be struggling, Lord, in their own soul, whether or not they, they truly are a believer. Pray, Lord, that you would work there and, and that if they need help, Lord, that they would come and talk to, to me or someone else who is a, a mature Christian who can help them with this matter of, of really knowing for sure they are genuinely believers. Lord, may you do your work. Encourage us as your people to allow your word to do its penetrating work in our lives. Lord, there's so much your word does, and we just touched on what this passage says. And But Lord, you, we know you, you use your word to, to weed out um, evil and wrong ideas and worldliness and in the lives of believers and we pray you'd do that and we pray that you would just help us lord to understand the, the nature and the function of your word so that it might be a a motivating um, tool that you use to bring us to that final rest and we ask in jesus name amen <music>